not quite okay we're we're, we're at two o'clock now uh, so we'll get started now um, everyone thank you very much for joining uh, joining live today or listening to the recording afterwards uh, so a reminder that this webinar is being recorded and we will be sharing some resources um, and Patricia's presentation in the next few days via the Q website. I'll start off with some uh, brief introductions to start with. So my name's Stacey, I'm the Associate Director uh, for Q, joined by um, Penny, who's the Director of the Q Initiative. Tim um, from the Health Foundation also is the Assistant Director for Improvement. And we're really privileged today to have uh, Trish join us uh, this afternoon. I'm going to do a brief introduction and then hand over to Trish for her presentation. So we'll have a wide range of people here um, on the call today. Um, some of you may be a member of Q or heard of Q previously. I thought I'd do a quick introduction um, as to what it's all about. So Q is a connected community uh, made up of people who have knowledge and experience um, of improvement. We want to make it easier for people to share and learn and collaborate. So we are investing in connections to break down silos and some of that, and that's boosted by um, work on specific topics, for example. Uh, we're trying to provide spaces for collaboration and it's uh, the collaborative approach to change that really is at the heart of Q. We'll have some information um, about the Q community in the chat box for you, for those who are interested in reading some more. So this event today is part of us seeing how we can adapt to the circumstances that we find ourselves in currently. So today and over the coming weeks, our intention is to share practical insights um, of service changes that are accelerating as part of the NHS response to COVID-19. We know there are unprecedented demands on the health system right now, so we want those insights to be helpful in progressing the work you're needing to do at pace rather than competing with it. Um, and we'd love to hear more about your thoughts on that. So I'll move on to the session today. So this online event will summarize um, how to introduce video consultations to increase the likelihood of success. We'll be providing some practical tips to help you implement video consultations now, and then the offer and a chance to ask questions and connect with others who are working in this space. And we do have some people on the call um, who are leading work in this area. We've got Joe Morris from BARTS, um, possibly some other colleagues from BARTS as well. Um, who as part of the Health Foundation Scaling Up programme have been leading some work in this space and also colleagues from NHS near me, uh, part of uh, Q Exchange funding by Q. So welcome to those people and really keen to hear your thoughts um, and experiences as well as we go through um, the next 50 minutes or so. So before I hand over to Trish, I will do a bit of process. Um, one of the things I'm learning when you have a large amount of people and we currently have 133, um, is that you need a bit of process. So please do keep your mic on mute um, whilst you're listening so we can avoid any background interference. Uh, Penny and Tim will be looking at the chat box. They'll be summarising and feeding in questions. I think um, given the numbers that we have, we, we may not have time to be drawing people into conversation, but I think we'll see how we, how we go with that. We've also had a number of questions submitted in advance. So thank you for taking the time to do that. We are really keen to support effective adoption um, over the coming weeks ahead. So do let us know in the chat if there's anything else we can do to help. Um, so what I'll do now is I will stop sharing my screen and I will hand over to you, Trish, um, to allow you to share yours. Great. Thanks very much, Stacey. And uh, thanks, everyone, for giving up your very valuable time for listening in. So I'm going to share my screen and... Hopefully, you can. You will now soon be able to see my. Yeah, that's PowerPoint. that's great, Trish. You can see that. You can see PowerPoint. I'm just going to move up. Um, it'll just take a couple of seconds to load, I think. And you should now see uh, a picture with uh, my name on it, and Oxford University and the NHS saying "video consulting with your patients." Is that what people can see? I don't think it's, it hasn't loaded quite, quite yet for me. Hasn't quite loaded. Wait a minute. No. Let me just have a look. Uh, 
bring your shared window to the front. What about that? Is that not going? Not yet. Just a second. Give me just one second about, um, let me stop sharing and then I'll try again. Because uh, the other way we could do it is I sent you the um, slides and you could do it from your end. I'm very happy to, sh to do that and share my screen and then... Um, Should I just have one more go and then... Yeah, and have then one more go and if not, um, I can, I'll yeah, go into my it, email. It, um, let me just uh, come out of my... Maybe because I'm, I'm using a screen. Right, let's have a go here. Sorry about that. Share. Ah, great. You get in there? Yes. How's that? Fantastic. So you, you can now see a little picture of someone doing a video consultation. Yes, all clear from my end. Thank you. Fantastic. I'm sure you'll hear from people on, on the chat if they can't see it. All right. So uh, acknowledging the input of the particularly the NHS near me people in Scotland, also people from BART's, uh, Joe Morris's team, who've uh, kindly allowed us to uh, sort of co-create some of this stuff uh, with us, the researchers, and then the, the teams on the ground. So I'll go through this fairly, uh, fairly quickly, except that it won't move. <laughs> I can't, uh, for some reason, make it move on. Um, there we are. Yeah, so what I'm going to cover uh, are five questions. You know, which patients are you going to uh, select or offer the video consultations to? How can we get set up? Once set up, how do you do a high quality video consultation? Uh, then the fourth thing I want to cover briefly is, well, how, how can the patient make the most of the video consultation? Um, and finally, um, if we've got time, I've just got one slide on, on some research evidence. So the first question is, when, when are video consultations appropriate? And I guess we made this slide before the COVID uh, pandemic uh, started. I've, I've amended it a bit, but uh, you know, the, the, what we thought of uh, appropriate was people with chronic stable conditions where nothing might kind of uh, immediately deteriorate but of course we're in a completely different ballpark now so I think in relation to COVID related uh, consultations by video um, if you're self-isolating that will be quite a lot of uh, um, clinicians with the, with the rules if you've had contact with a COVID patient if the patient either has COVID or is self-isolating um, most of those patients might, you might get away with a, a telephone call, but you know, video is good, particularly if the patient is very anxious or if they're sicker. Uh, care homes, we're seeing people um, do quite a lot of video consultations to care homes, uh, which as you know, are high risk group, and also poss possibly providing remote cover for staff sickness. So when you've got a lot of staff off sick in one particular locality, uh, others from a different locality might be able to uh, provide some support. And then don't forget uh, the rest of real life general practice with um, your routine chronic disease checks, your counselling, um, and any condition where the trade-off between seeing the person in, in, in person and seeing them remotely um, is, uh, it, it favours uh, the remote, which is most of them at the moment, given how serious uh, COVID can be. Uh, it's not so appropriate when the patient has a, has a very serious high risk condition. You know, for example, if you think the patient's got acute meningitis, um, you know, I, I think there are situations when it, it really would be better to visit them or bring them in. Um, if you need to measure oxygen saturation for that clinical decision, having said that, I heard yesterday that some localities are now sending around packs to patients with query COVID containing oximeters, which is quite an exciting development. Obviously, if the patient needs to be examined, um, there's some evidence that patients who've got comorbidities affecting their ability to use the technologies, such as confusion, um, that's going to be very difficult unless they've got a relative with them. Uh, and patients who, for example, have paranoia or severe psychosis 
uh, can feel very uncomfortable uh, with the doctor popping up in, in the video screen. Uh, in terms of hard of hearing patients, uh, some really like video because they can lip read or they can use the chat function. Others are not so comfortable. So that's an area where the patient needs to make a bit of choice. All right, so what you really want to hear about today is how can the practice get set up for video consultations? And people are doing this really quickly when they've been sort of hanging around for months thinking, is this worthwhile doing? Um, it now suddenly is for reasons that I don't need to spell out to you. Um, so how do you get started if you haven't, if, if this hasn't happened before? Well, the first thing you need to do is get a few people around the table, but that might have to be a virtual table. Uh, you know, the, the, in these circumstances, you probably need your practice manager, you need one clinician at least, possibly two, and also the sort of admin reception staff who are going to know those booking um, protocols and, and work pathways better than you do. Um, so so get, get the people who are going to be doing the job. Um, you need to agree, what, broadly speaking, what kind of patient is going to be seen by video, you need to make some kind of agreement on what hardware and software will be used. I've just heard that uh, Attend Anywhere is suddenly free for a lot of NHS organisations. Um, and you need to involve staff uh, quite widely and quite early. Uh, now, the evidence on introducing radical new changes involving technologies, involving the real changes in people, to, the way people do their jobs, uh, means, and I, I think you probably know this if you're in the Q community, you've got to treat it as a quality improvement project, not a technology project. And the staff are going to be more on board if you not just inform them, but engage them and take their concerns seriously. They're going to have some concerns, um, particularly about the pace of change. Uh, so make sure those are surfaced and discussed and heard uh, and taken on board. And finally, uh, technical support. Hopefully there'll be local technical support that you can plug into uh, and, and link up with for troubleshooting. So setting up the technology, and I'm not going to go through this in massive detail because I think it's going to be different depending on which technology you're using, but you do need a good internet connection. Hopefully most of you have got fast broadband. You need obviously to, to get hold of your software and your peripherals and, and, and set those up, but that's not really the hard bit. The hard bit is gonna be the organizational processes and the change. Uh, if you've already had this stuff installed for quite some time, um, make, check it. It's, it might be sitting on, uh, technically it's installed on, on your desktop, but, it, but you really need to make sure that it's, it's the latest version and all that kind of thing. Um, if you are planning to work remotely, uh, and let's face it, a lot of us are going to be self-isolating, um, and that means we're probably going to be working from home, make sure that your home computer is, um, is, is uh, sufficiently uh, of the standard to uh, be able to, to run this kind of thing. I mean, there are certain standards, and you've probably got a reasonable machine at home, uh, that's fine. But you do need to ensure that you've got both read and write access to practice records um, and make some information for your patients. Uh, and there are quite a lot of downloads. I've made some, uh, some stuff. Claire Morrison, who's on the line, has made some fantastic inf information and videos for patients. Uh, so there's lots to choose from. Now you've got to set up the workflows. Um, you've got to update your practice website. That's obvious. You know, this is going to happen from such and such a date. You've got to update your clinic templates to show where the availability is for your video appointments. And then you've got to create an appointment code for a video consultation. And I would suggest that you create a particular code for a COVID related video consultation, because that might be a video consultation you wouldn't normally be doing by video uh, or you're doing it for different reason if you see what I mean. Um, put, put some kind of process in place for your appointment. Somebody in your practice will know how to do this, I don't. Um, and also put arrangements in place for various logistical things like collecting specimens. Um, hopefully most patients are already doing the e-transfer of their prescriptions but some people might not. Um, and then make a sort of agreed contingency plan for what's going to happen uh, if the video link fails. Then we do some training. 
Um, the best kind of training for any quality improvement is, is a sort of on the job team training where a confident member of the team is training their own peers because that's all the sort of social learning stuff. Sit them in a classroom and give them talk and chalk. It doesn't work so well. Um, Make sure everybody's got the kit in their rooms, or if there's only one room that's going to be used for this, make sure every, everyone knows you know, where it is and, and how to kind of book into it. And then make your dummy calls. I think absolutely everybody's got a patient called Mickey Mouse, that kind of thing. And you can make an entry on Mickey Mouse's record just to make sure that the whole process, process works. Um, okay, so a few tips for actually doing the consultation. This is based on a, some detailed research that uh, my team did. Um, first of all, just make as much as you can confirm that a video consultation is, is clinically appropriate in the circumstances. Make sure the door's shut, make sure the kids aren't running around behind you, that kind of thing. Check the patient's phone number. Um, that's the first thing you're going to ask them for when you actually go through uh, to them. Um, have the patient's medical record open, preferably on a second screen. So I've just got two screens here. I'm sure many of you do. If you have the record on one screen and the patient on the other screen, that, that works quite well. And then just before you call the patient, do your sound and uh, visual test. So starting the consultation, obviously you click the link. And if you see uh, the box number seven there, the start of a video consultation is nothing like the start of a face-to-face -face consultation. Uh, usually, or quite often, the doctor and patient are both yelling at each other, can you hear me? Having, you know, all that kind of thing. And it, it just feels very unprofessional and awkward. But one of the things we've demonstrated is quite quickly, about, after about 10 seconds usually, um, usually the clinician, sometimes the patient says, right, okay, I think we're connected, let's get started. And from that point on, uh, the consultation tends to happen in exactly the same way as, um, as a face-to-face -face consultation. Now, uh, the box number eight says you've got to take verbal consent for a video consultation, but uh, we've had some uh, up to the minute advice from NHSX, which is now on their website, saying that if they're clicking the link, they've implied consent for a video consultation. So you don't really have to do that anymore. Um, introduce anyone who's off camera, if you've got a student in the corner, uh, and ask the patient to do the same. Obviously, they're entitled to have someone uh, in the room, not, not in view, but you are also entitled to know that that person is there. Um, and then, yeah, just say to the patient, this is going to be exactly the same as your standard face to face, except I won't be able to put my hands on you. Um, so during the consultation, it might feel a little bit less fluent. It might feel, you know, people freeze, it goes blurry, have a few technical problems. Uh, but actually, we've shown that this usually doesn't uh, interfere that much with what you're saying and what the patient's saying and, and the kind of decision making. So don't worry if you have a few glitches. It, obviously major glitches are a different matter. You don't need to look at the little dot in the top of the screen which shows the cam. Just looking at the screen is fine. Um, and it's important to tell the patient if you're turning your head to, for example, look at their record or make some notes because it's quite disconcerting for patients if you keep sort of turning and showing them your ear. Um, they, they, they won't know what you're doing. Um, make the same kind of written records as you would in a standard consultation. So remember to write down that you've given safety netting advice, that kind of thing. Um, do be aware that this is going to be a little bit harder for the patient as well as for you. Um, try and reassure them. Try and be kind and nice to them. There is some evidence um, that, that doctors are sometimes a little bit less, um, what's the word, um, empathetic in a remote consultation. Okay, so closing the consultation, don't forget to summarize because the patient may have missed something uh, because of the technical issues, because of lag. So make sure you summarize very clearly and perhaps check that they've understood um, and also that they know what they're supposed to do next. Uh, also, it's a good idea to confirm and, and put in their record uh, if they were happy to use video again. I mean, they may not get a choice during the COVID, but, but there are some patients who say, I never want to use that again. It's a good idea to record that. And then finally, at the end of the consultation, um, tell the patient you're going to hang up. 
uh, we've had a few patients say, well, hang on a minute, the doctor just hung up on me and they felt that that was very rude. And of course, all you did was hit the close button. So if you can say, I'm going to hit the close button now, goodbye, that, that, that's uh, uh, more comforting. So just something very briefly on patients, same kind of thing really. Um, if they just want general advice, the best thing is to stick NHS coronavirus advice into Google and see what comes up. There's lots of good stuff. They don't need to talk to you about that. Phone call will do, um, but if they want reassurance, and many of them do these days, uh, seeing a doctor's or nurse's face really does help. Um, and the idea that, that the patients may not know or may not have realized that you might be self-isolating. So that needs to be made clear in your patient information uh, materials. If anyone wants to use these um, pictures that I'm showing, I think you, you're all gonna access the slides. You can use them um, in your patient leaflets if they're helpful. Um, so for the patient getting set up technically, it's the same kind of thing. I won't go through every single one of them, uh, but this may not be a sequence that the patient is very familiar with. Uh, they may not ever have used the practice website, for example, uh, and patients may have a lower quality computer. It, it may be on a sort of short term battery, that kind of thing. We've, had, we've seen a few problems with that. So remind them to charge the battery of their phone or, the, or their computer before they start. So I won't go through that in any great detail. Uh, and again, you can see this sort of step-by-step -step instruction. They do need to be told to say hello or wave uh, to the doctor or nurse, because that's not the sort of thing you normally do to a doctor or nurse. You'd normally be a bit more deferential. So it's all right to yell at them a bit um, just to get connected. Um, so during the consultation, again, we can say to the patient, just look at the screen. Um, you know, it should feel just like a, a standard consultation. Uh, you can use the camera to move the camera around if it's a smartphone uh, to show the doctor parts of your body um, and what to do if you get cut off. Um, so, so really the patient instruction here is a sort of mirror of what, what we're telling the doctors. Um, so that was the end of the uh, NHS bit. And then there's just a brief summary of the research literature, very briefly, which is that the randomized controlled trials that have been done have mostly been based in hospital outpatients. Video seems very safe and, and, and acceptable, but it's largely irrelevant to the current situation. So we're flying completely blind. There is no research literature on the current usage. We're hoping to do some. Um, as I've said, what the qualitative research shows is that introducing video consultations is, is culturally and operationally challenging, and it's far better to frame it as a sort of quality improvement project than uh, just here's a technology, implement it. Um, I've been through the, the idea that face-to-face that -face and video consultations are run very similarly. Um, it's sometimes possible to examine patients by video. I think we may have a bit of a discussion on that. Uh, and the last thing to say is there's, there's some very limited evidence from Australian bushfires of all, all things that it is possible for an entire country or very large part of the country to get set up and mobilise video consultations quickly in an emergency. Uh, and it doesn't half help if there's a bit of extra money and staff time to do that. Uh, so I hope that was helpful, acknowledging our uh, funders on the last slide. And I'm now going to stop sharing and uh, hopefully there'll be lots of questions. Great, Tris. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to uh, share my screen now uh, to bring us back. Hopefully you can, all, you can all see that now. So thank you very much. So much content and insight in there from workflows and planning through to the environment that people are sitting in um, and loads of loads of uh, questions and information being shared in the chat box as well and just to say we will be looking back at what's coming through the chat box to collate um, all of that and share it back with you afterwards so I'm now going to hand over to Penny uh, Penny and Tim uh, will be leading the Q&A section with Trish so Penny I'll hand over to you now Hi, thanks for that, Trish. It was great. Um, we had quite a few questions submitted in advance, so I thought I'd start with a couple of those. We had um, two people who were asking about using um, video consultations in a group setting. So Suzanne Connolly and Fran Hallam were 
wondering whether there were particular tips for using it in a group setting. Yeah, I've never used it in a group setting. And I, I mean, Joe, we've got this research project going on group clinics in diabetes, but we didn't really do those by video, did we? You Can you unmute and help me? <laughs> no, <laughs> in, in short, <laughs> we haven't. So, But I think we should. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking, and I think there are um, people who do do group clinics, but again, the same um, thing will, the, the, the same problem will be that if you're talking about COVID, but I guess you wouldn't do a group clinic for people with COVID. I mean, these days yeah. we're all supposed to be isolating, so there won't be any groups, will there? There's Not a thought. Um, but basically, the, the, the research literature on group clinics uh, will, by video will be... Um, will will be related to, to the sort of management of chronic disease now actually i'll tell you where they have done some up in scotland i was out on the outer hebrides uh, a couple of months ago and i met um some people who were doing group physiotherapy um so there would be a, a group that was meeting with a physiotherapist for i think it was cardiac physio or, or respiratory rehab i can't remember um, and then that physio went sick or retired or something. And so there was a group in a, in a particular locality that were already meeting. Um, and as I recall, I think Claire Morris might have to help me here, but, but actually they, they uh, got a remote physio to link in with the same group uh, and it worked fine. But that's just an anecdotal story. Do you want to say anything about that one, Claire? Or oh, um, Trish, I should say that the chat box is responding in the perfect way. So we've had several comments where people are sharing examples where they've used group consultations. So oh, can you read some out? Summarise that, but um, yeah, there's some good intelligence being shared, which we will summarise in the write up afterwards. Brilliant! You don't need me, do you? <laughs> um, so Trish, I've got a question for you now on rapid deployment. So time and space have been traditionally stressed as enablers for successful implementation when you've got something complex like this. Interestingly, a year ago, we asked you members, uh, this was in the light of the long-term plans drive to use it more in outpatients. What, what would most help with implementing it? And their, their top ask was time and space for designing. Yeah, absolutely. And but so, people don't have that. So uh, how can no, they shortcut? Don't worry. don't worry. What they have got now is something even better than time or space. This is going to be a lot easier than it would have been if we hadn't had COVID. That is not to say I'm very happy with the current situation. Um, so let's go back to the 1950s. Uh, the person who did all the research into what they call diffusion of innovations uh, was Everett Rogers. He was a social psychologist from America and he did work in a, in a big bit in the middle, a sort of big oblong in the middle of America called Iowa. It's absolutely huge. Um, and all they do there is grow corn. Um, I once hitchhiked across it, it took me a whole day and there was nothing but corn. Now what Everett Rogers did was he tried to get the farmers to take up new farming practices, things like fertilizers and what they called hybrid corn, and they were really, really slow to do it. Uh, and that got him interested in why they were so slow. And he developed this whole theory of diffusion of innovations based on these, these uh, farmers, because some of the farmers were quite quick. So he said, that, and he did actually over 300 different research studies, um, him and his team over the next sort of 40 years. And on the basis of those 300 studies, he came up with a set of criteria for an innovation that helps people um, adopt it. And out of all the different criteria, the most important thing was something called relative advantage. In other words, is it better than what was previously practice? Now, the reason why the farmers adopted the new corn was because it was twice the size of the old corn, because it grew faster, it was better, it tasted better. And so even though they were really conservative, you know, these are sort of the Trump voter types, whatever, um, they, and they, you know, they don't like new things. They all adopted the hybrid corn because it was better. Now, what we've got here is a, a novel situation in which suddenly remote consulting is just phenomenally better than seeing people face to face. I was on uh, the video uh, yesterday to the, to the London wide local medical committee people who were saying we don't want GPs seeing any patient face to face with COVID because 
you know, the GP might die, the patient might catch COVID off the GP and die. It's all become incredibly perilous. So because relative advantage is so overwhelmingly in favor of video, you guys are going to make it work because, because you've got to make it work because suddenly it's, it's um, mission critical to make it work. Having said that, yes, time would be a good idea, but we don't have it in our favor. Um, what are the other things? I'll tell you another one. One of the uh, features that Everett Rogers demonstrated was trialability and observability. And what's happening on Twitter, as I'm following the GPs who are introducing video for the first time, is they're all nervous at the beginning. And then people post, well, I had a go. I did a whole surgery by video today and it went fine. Um, it was quicker than my normal surgery. Um, nothing went wrong. And so they, they are feeding back that I tried it out and it wasn't as difficult as I thought it was. And then they're away because they've, they've, they've seen that, that actually, you know, nothing terrible happened. The world didn't end. Uh, the technology didn't fail. So, so it, it might help build long term confidence then. Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so on, the, on this, we've got a question from Catherine Sykes who says, what are your top tips for rapid deployment, given that we've got to do it quickly? How, how can people shortcut what would ideally be a longer process? Well, it's a really good question. I think it's going to depend on your local circumstance. I don't think there's a quick fix. Quite often in a practice, you've got someone who's a bit more techy, a bit more confident in introducing uh, sort of novel technology, perhaps the person who you go and get when, you're, when, when your computer freezes or something like that. And that person might want to get started and pilot it and give it a go just with a few patients. Um, I would also suggest, uh, because this is complex change, um, talking to other people in a comparable practice who've done it quite recently. So there may be that there's a practice down the road who's actually done it. Not only should the GPs talk to the GPs, but the practice manager should talk to the practice manager and the receptionist should talk to the receptionist. So that's what's known as the beacon model where you actually, you can't physically visit um, the practice for, for, for obvious reasons, you know, we're all in lockdown, but you can, um, you know, set up, for example, a call like this where you chat to each other and then they'll say, well, the thing you want to worry about is this. Um, what else? Uh, what would you say, Claire? You've got more experience uh, than I have in this. You got Claire Morrison? I think she might be muted. Um, I was. Uh, I've just unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so um, I, uh, the, the messages that we've been giving to people is around thinking about your technical setup, thinking about your processes, and making sure that everyone's trained. And um, so, those kind of three distinct areas. Um, and and absolutely, if you can get people to share information and talk to each other ab about it, it, it works so much better. And the learning from each other is huge. Mm. Great. Uh, should I say it, Bart? At Bart's, this has become part of our emergency planning, really, and it's being prioritised with all the other pressures that people are under. Um, and as part of that, the informatics team have prioritised um, changing the um, computer system so that we are recording these as video appointments. Um, and we're having to prioritise clinics that we're setting up because of the bandwidth. We're, we are slightly cautious about the, the limits of with the bandwidth so we're prioritizing clinics to set up first and we've got dedicated people working on it so that's at Bart's. Are we, uh, um, go on Penny. Two other questions uh, just um, I, I'm sure plenty more will come through and uh, I'm going to feed in a couple more questions that were submitted in advance so James Mountford and Karen Allen um, are both asking about uh, choice of platform so if you're mobilizing quickly from a standing start what's the best platform specific question about uh, NHS therapists and um, which platforms offer the greatest security. Uh, I wonder if you have any reflections on that. Well, interesting. First of all, I'm not paid by anybody to promote their platform. That, that's the first thing. Um, Scotland News Attend Anywhere, and I guess I've got most experience uh, looking at Attend Anywhere in Scotland because we spent quite a lot of time up there doing a lot of ethnography. Uh, so, so I've been very impressed with Attend Anywhere. It's not the only good product out there. I've seen people struggle with 
video platforms that were not designed for healthcare consultations. So the unique selling point of Attend Anywhere and some of the other ones, AccuRx, I think is another one, is that it is designed for a healthcare workflow where what happens is the patient clicks a button and, then, and you know, they're immediately in their own private waiting room. And then when the doctor or nurse uh, is ready to consult with them, they can see, if you like, their virtual waiting list of people who are sitting each in their, vir their own virtual waiting room. And you just click on it and up pops the patient. And it, and it really is uh, incredibly sort of simple and intuitive. Uh, but that's not the only way to do it. I have seen people consult through, uh, we used to use uh, just plain old um, customer consumer level Skype, didn't we, uh, Joe, and uh, Bart's for a long time. In fact, we did Adobe before that. That was about 10 years ago. And there were an awful lot of problems with, with those. Um, Microsoft Teams, people are using Zoom, which is what we're using now. Um, but I'd say if someone's offering you attend anywhere for free, and I'm not making any profit out of this myself, I'd say you... you, you you could do worse than um, go with that. The other reason for going with that is, of course, that Scotland have produced a lot of free resources for patients, uh, which are going to be very similar if you're using the same platform. I don't know if uh, Claire or Jeremy has come in there. We're also having some um, further comments and discussion in the chat box. Got a particular question about the best platform for remote devices that's come through. I don't know if anyone could pick that up. Remote devices? Yeah, so oh, that's mean, man, I'm guessing. Well, I think one of the things about Attend Anywhere is that you don't have to download anything. It's just a web link. So I would say that, that it's, it's kind of um, agnostic to what you're using to connect with. Is that your experience, Claire? Um, yep, absolutely. Um, uh, it, it is definitely really easy to use um, for patients because of the fact that you aren't having to uh, um, get them to download something in advance. Um, it is just a case of sending them um, a, a website address and real flexibility um, in what's used. So um, I think having that um, makes it a lot easier than having to send people a specific connection. Um, and we do find that people get lost if, if there's a requirement to do that. Trish, I've got a question from Anna Mandeville. How can I encourage patients who may be reluctant to try video platforms? I'm struck by the fact you said a lot of the research was with kind of willing patient volunteers, maybe more stable or lower risk patients. Now it's for everybody and, and some will be reluctant. So how, how can we encourage those who might be reluctant? And there's a slightly cynical answer to that, which is if the GP isn't allowed to see you face to face, they're not going to have a huge amount of choice. So what they're going to have is a telephone call or a video, take it or leave it. Uh, and in, the, in England, they're, they're introducing total triage. Some of you might have been on that call that I was on uh, earlier on in the week with Minal uh, and Dave from um, NHS England. Um, and what's going to happen is they, they're going to have to enter symptoms on, on, a, on a sort of web um, a portal and then someone will either phone them back or video them back. Now, if the patient says, I just can't cope with video uh, and you phone them, um, what might happen is that they may become a little bit more confident. If you say, look, you don't sound very well. I'd like to get back in touch with you tomorrow. And would you mind if I videoed it this time? Um, but I think in the end, uh, I think people are going to be a lot more motivated than they were because the video of course adds value that you will be able to see the doctor's face you'll be able to show them whatever part of you you're worried about uh, and, and I rather suspect that, that a lot of people are going to kind of overcome their inhibitions. Yeah and just following up from that we've had the same question from Emma Bailey and Christine Hoy is there a guide to, for patients to prepare for video consultations maybe to help them build confidence and get ready? Yeah, funnily enough, there is, uh, we've been working with an artist who's been, uh, who did the drawings for the, um, for the slides I, I showed you, Anna, Anne Os Osling Smee, and she has been working with my team to produce a guide for patients, and that I'm hoping, I think we, there were some emails flying around earlier this morning with, um, between us and you, Penny, um, we're hoping the Health Foundation's going to um, host some of those as downloads. Is, is that right? 
When um, we sent around the recording of um, this call and a sort of synthesis of the discussion, we'll also include at that point links to the resources, um, both that have been referenced on this call and other ones that we'll be posting. So need uh, another couple of days. Yeah, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be too long. Should I um, come in with a couple more questions? Mm. Um, so um, we've been asked uh, by Kerry Duff about how to measure performance as you're introducing uh, this new service. So I think it's slightly longer term. Um, and um, I'll, I'll feed you in a different uh, separate question as well. Um, a little bit more information about remote consultations in secondary care. Conscious that some of the content that you've fed through is specific to primary care. Yes, very much. Yes. Okay. So let's do how to measure performance. Whose performance are we talking about? Are we talking about the organization's performance? Are we talking about the health system's performance? Are we talking about the clinician's performance? I think the question is broad. Um, in any yeah. point of service, I guess we want to understand how things are going for the purposes of learning, uh, research, and to make sure that we're coding and recording them properly. Okay, so, so this wasn't one that I'm particularly prepared for, but I'm just thinking how we're looking at it, because we've got the contract to evaluate the introduction of Attend Anywhere in Scotland, and we did have to come up with some performance metrics. And the really obvious one is, are you doing any consultations at all by video? So there was, um, it seems a long time ago now, the Vanguards. Uh, do you remember the, who remembers the Vanguards? Uh, there was a couple of vanguard initiatives to introduce video consultations and when we went along to evaluate them nobody had done any um it, it'd all become too much and so they'd all reverted to telephone or email um so the obvious one is are you doing any at all that's pretty crude and then of course how many video consultations are you doing um then you can do, you know, if, if this kind of takes off and carries on, you can do sort of measures of disease progression, all that kind of thing. But the other one I would be looking at now in the current climate is critical events, significant events. Um, you've probably got a folder of those, you know, near misses, all that kind of thing. What did we learn from? Um, I suspect you will be doing an awful lot of consultations by video, but I would also keep a uh, a file of either significant events, perhaps not critical events, of, of things where something either went badly wrong or went didn't go too wrong, but could have gone could have done worse, and at some point sit and uh, you know reflect on those um, you know and and use those to to um, feed into quality improvement. But I think it's such a broad question; it's hard to um, it's hard to um, be hard and fast. Does anyone, Joe or Claire, do you yeah. want to say anything about that? I think we've got some good responses coming through in the chat box. So perhaps we'll move on to other questions. Yeah. Some good feedback from Joe and from Claire. Um, and nice to you talk about maybe some of the balancing measures or things that we need to look out for that, that might be downsides of the introduction. So hey. Trish, we, we've had a slew of questions on information governance. Um, what tips you've got there. In particular, Natalie Strack and Brenda Smith both asking which packages are GDPR compliant, is uh -huh. Zoom GDPR compliant? What are your tips? T t tell us about this. Uh, I'm not the expert on what is compliant and what's not. One of the problems is that once a company finds out that nobody's buying their product because it's not compliant with a the regulation, they change their product. And so when something, you know, something that might have been non-compliant a month ago might well become compliant. So, so I think you've got to be a bit careful about that. I don't know the answer to that, but what I do know is um, just before we went on air, Joe sent me a, um, a link to a new um, release today, I think, from NHSX that said, look, we're kind of letting it all hang fairly loose at the moment with um, the COVID crisis because it, it's what they call... Um, overwhelming overriding public interest and so that's already in the gdpr le legislation matt hancock tweeted about it about a week ago um, if there is an overriding public interest to use a piece of technology it doesn't matter whether it's gdpr compliant or not that's helpful and thank you to joe and morris for sending a link to that nhs x guidance penny um well, we've got some specific questions about introduction in different clinical contexts. Um, again, to hear, keen to hear more about um, implementation in secondary care. We've got some particular questions. Oh, yeah, secondary care, yeah. Settings. 
um, and contacts with people with dementia and also the use of interpreters. Um, Okay, so sorry, I forgot about forgot to say about secondary care because actually almost all the research that we've done on um, video consultations has been in secondary care, and primary care has been much slower. I'm not necessarily much slower, but but they haven't really needed it. They I, I interviewed someone in Scotland in November who said there is no clinical need to uh, use video because the patients all live around the corner they can just wander around and if they're not well enough to come around to us they usually need a home visit well hasn't life changed now with secondary care um there's been a bit more of a motivation because patients have had to travel a long way and often you're covering for peripheral clinics and that kind of thing so the tips for uh setting up in secondary care well joe's probably the best person to talk about because we've been uh, working with you guys and i think one of the things bart's did was sort of set up a central unit within the hospital. And I think I should hand over to you, Joe, to tell people what, what exactly that was about and how that central unit managed to kind of spread from one service in the hospital, diabetes, yeah. to probably about 15 and now. Yeah, well, setting this up obviously crosses a, across so many services in the trust from IT to governance, um, clinical governance as well. Um, so the structure that we set up probably in the current climate isn't probably the way we're setting it up now um so we you know we had to get lots of people on board at different levels in the trust and then when you're working on a clinic level you're working through um processes within the clinic and flows within the clinic working with the local clinic teams as well so you're working on all different levels within the trust um and making sure that things run smoothly but at the current moment we're we're trying to fast track all that by having myself and a colleague as the main contact point who people contact and then we're having to prioritize the clinics that we're setting up and um, we have IT working on this so we have contact people in lots of key areas within the trust who are helping us right at the moment um, and we're fast tracking the setup on Millennium uh, electronic patient records because we still feel it's important that these are recorded properly as um, video appointments rather than face-to-face -face appointments so we've got team focusing on that at the moment um, and so many people are wanting to give this a go at the moment it's really escalating fast uh, we're actually using attend anywhere which trisha mentioned earlier um, and there's some great resources that that attend anywhere have um, and we have some resources on our web website as well which i've put the link in the chat box um, so at the moment it is a different situation and around governance at the moment we are using implied consent if people click on the links and go to our website we're having a central button put on the website for people to click on that will will take them straight into the attend anywhere system we're sending people out letters or we're not actually sure we're communicating with people quite rapidly about the change in their appointments so people are being offered video appointments um, we're just saying your appointment which was face to face has been changed to video if you do not want this um, then we have a number for you to call to make this a phone consultation but at the moment I think the majority of appointments are going to video or phone um, and we're trying to encourage the use of video obviously with some caution over the bandwidth so we're closely monitoring that so we're having to work with lots of departments across the trust at the moment but yeah our experience in secondary care has this has been really valuable so often people are traveling huge distances to some of the specialist clinics um, and it has massive advantages to them um, so yes it's been very successful and often the some of the clinicians know their patients quite well so for follow-up appointments this works very well in secondary yeah. care um, and for long-term conditions but obviously at the moment it's being used widely uh, in lots of different settings so we are testing it uh, in ways that we wouldn't have done previously but yeah but we're trying to fast track it Joe, can I ask, have you, are you using it for urgent care? I mean, that's the thing that, that we're, um, I was asked about uh, the possibility of this happening um, where I'm based in Oxford. I don't think it's happening yet, but instead of um, patients actually being seen in the A&E department mm -hmm. is that they, they, would, they might be physically in the building, but they would be in a room and, and the doctor would be in a different room, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I don't think we are at the moment, but I mean, I think anything is possible at the moment. So I don't think yeah. we currently are. 
At the moment, we're still working with uh, the clinics that we were already working with. We're expanding it in those services and then taking on new clinics as quickly as we can, particularly the ones where there's a clinical, particular clinical need to see the patient rather than to just talk over the phone. Um, and there's yeah. some talk about clinicians working at home as well, obviously. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's, I think that's going to be a, a quite a big thing as people start getting into the stage where they're doing the 14 days of self-isolating but feel perfectly well. I think there's going to be a lot of consulting from home. Yeah. Trish, yeah. sorry, go on, Joanne. No, I'm just going to say the, there is a slight governance concern about people working at home, which uh, is about making sure that they record the, informa the clinical information after the consultation properly and uh, get the GP letters still out. So that's the concern at the moment that we're working on that. And obviously, if needs be, I would think there'll be a decision taken about that. But at the moment, that is something we're working on to try and make sure that we can maintain that um, documentation. So, um, I'm Trish. conscious we have, um, sorry, Tim, one more, um, uh, probably time for one more question. I'll hand over to you, Tim, to ask that in a moment. But I wonder in the chat box whether anybody who's on the call can help with the specific questions that Shabeen, Mary and Jackie have raised around the use of interpreters, um, the use for paediatric clinics and um, the, the use for people with uh, dementia. Um, so we won't ask Trish to respond on those specifics now. I'll hand over to Tim. But if anybody has experience of that, please um, feed in via the chat box. Tim. So Trish, you mentioned the importance of empathy and how even in this emergency situation, there's still really important quality considerations to be taken into account. Debbie Brazil has asked for your thoughts on breaking bad news to people by remote consultation. And there are different schools of thought, obviously. Some people find it impersonal. Um, on the other hand, I've heard Shanti in the BARTS team talk very persuasively about how it's better for a patient sometimes to receive bad Absolutely. news in their own hand. Absolutely. What's your view on this? Yeah, I think this whole idea this, that you can't break bad news via video, it has to be face to face. Uh, sorry, that's, that's just yesterday's recommendation. Um, not long ago, I was up in Scotland um, sitting in <clears throat> with a respiratory nurse who was telling a patient, the patient had gone off to be assessed as to whether he could have a lung transplant or not. And if he didn't have his lung transplant, he was going to carry on deteriorating and he wouldn't have very much longer to live. And I report this case with his consent. Um, the nurse said, well, I've got the letter back from the doctor and I'm afraid, you know, for various reasons, you, you're not going to be eligible for the lung transplant, which means you're not, you, you're not going to get one. Now, she didn't say it like that. She, she said it in a, in a very skilled and, and incredibly um, empathetic way. Uh, and the patient was, was someone that she knew um, and she'd been looking after this patient for a few years. And he was in, he was at home in the bosom of his family. His wife wasn't far away. He didn't have to have a two and a half hour drive to get back to where he was, you know, to his home from the hospital. Um, and the other thing he said was, because I'm sitting at home, I, c I haven't actually had to, to use all that energy to get out of my car and walk in and sit in, in the outpatient waiting room. I'm actually calmer, you know, to have that conversation with the nurse. Now, that's the, the only time I've seen breaking seriously bad news to someone. But frankly, the technology did not get in the way. Um, it, I, I'm... I'm, I know the rule of thumb, but I don't see that there's any um, that there's any really good evidence base for that. It's, it just sort of feels better to have the person in front of you. Mm. And to be honest, I think it's because we don't like to do it over the telephone um, because we want to see the patient. We want to be able to provide that human reassurance or, or support. But I think with a good quality video connection, uh, there's no reason why you shouldn't do it. Um, Thanks. And if I've got 60 seconds to squeeze one more in, Mary Salama asks about experience of the, using these consultations with children. Any special considerations there for video consultations with children? No, I've not really had that much. I've, I've talked to parents who've, whose kids have had um, speech therapy, for example, um, a couple of uh, mental health patients, you know, sort of um, <coughs> like... <coughs> I don't know, whatever adolescents get, uh, they quite like it because they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're not scared of the computer. And also it sometimes gives them a bit more confidence. 
so using their own computer rather than going into a hospital because a lot of kids don't you know kids and teenagers don't go into hospital much whereas they use the computer for a lot of things i've never heard anyone i mean claire or um joanne i haven't heard any problem with with kids um yeah I can say we don't have a lot of experience with kids, um, but one thing I have been told older children, sometimes like the privacy they can have over video because their parent doesn't have to necessarily be in the yeah. room for older children. Yeah. They don't have to accompany them in the way that they have to take them to clinic, maybe. Yeah. Thanks, Trish. Um, again, there's some great exchange going on in the chat box on that. Um, I think we have time for one final question, and uh, I think we've covered all the questions submitted in advance and in the chat box. So I'm going to take the opportunity to ask one myself. Just stepping back to finish, you talked about how video consultations are thriving at the moment because of the relative advantage over face-to-face -face consultations. I wonder where you imagine we might be in in six months' time. Say we're the other side of the the current crisis, how far do you see a, a shift back to face-to-face -to -face consultations versus continuing? Oh, I think, yeah, I think we will have broken, we will have shown proof of concept. Um, I think people will now, um, we'll, we'll have the systems in place and I hope that a lot of consultations will now go um, either by video or phone. I've got a friend actually who uh, goes to a cholesterol clinic and she's been going every six months sitting in a waiting room to be told her cholesterol is perfectly fine on the medication. And she said she had a telephone consultation today to say her cholesterol is perfectly fine on the medication. Uh, and she said, I'm never going back to that clinic. I mean, why would you? So in that sense, I think this has been a really interesting opportunity. But, you know, I'm not sure that we're, we're going to be um, through the COVID crisis in six months time, but that is a completely different conversation. So, you know. Great, thank you. Um, so we've just got uh, a few minutes before uh, we close off. Um, just want to say thank you to Trish. So much insight, content, tips, and it's just uh, really present in the chat box, all of the conversations that are going on. And if I, um, if I can quote you, Claire Morrison, the um, the importance of sharing information, talking to one another when you're testing and rolling this out is absolutely vital um, in order to be learning, you know, from across across boundaries with colleagues who are down the road. Um, and what I'm really reflecting on now is the how the benefit of actually working virtually, like the call today, enables us to share and learn from one another one another as well. Lots of sharing going on in the chat box. So thank you to everybody for your engagement. Special thanks to Trish, to Penny and Tim as well. Um, if anyone has um, any further interest in continuing to have some conversations about this topic in particular, do get in contact with us, either direct to the queue inbox or on the chat just now before we close. There are some options that we could do, either having some further calls on this subject area, sharing more about where people are, some of the challenges that you're facing. We could convene a special interest specifically on this topic if that was of interest to you. So do let us know. So, Thanks again, it's just before three o'clock, so I'll give you a few minutes time back. Thank you for joining, and we'll be sharing and collating the information both in the chat box and also sharing the, um, the video recording and Trish's presentation. So thanks very much, everyone, and take care. Have a good afternoon. <laughs>